Welcome back to Tending to Talks, a space for heartfelt conversations aimed at sparking self-reflection and nurturing optimism, even and especially in challenging times. I'm likely to tweak this intro each time we meet. For as long as we inhabit planet Earth, our connection to other creatures and how we navigate that bond is what will continue to shape our mutual fates. Whether it's out of love or necessity, how we treat animals speaks volumes about who we are. Conversations surrounding this matter rightfully focus on concepts such as morality, compassion and the reassessment of economic interests amidst limited resources. Yet, should we also not turn our attention to the collective human condition that establishes the norms and customs preserving the status quo? On this topic, among others, I had the pleasure of engaging in dialogue with Helena Pedersen, a researcher and educator at Gothenburg University in Sweden. Helena's research falls into critical animal studies and critical animal pedagogy. Her focus is on human-animal relations as an area of critical inquiry and education research. She's interested in how the education system forms its human and non-human subjects and how animals figure in the production, mediation, and dissemination of knowledge. Join us. Ever since I first read your published works, I have become particularly fond of them for both the content and the style. I must say I quite like the surgical precision with which you challenge some of the ideas we may have on our relationship um, with animals and animals' role in education. It both is and isn't uncommon for a researcher to talk so openly about what for many is a normal evolutionary behavior. Our use of animals is often excused with a supposed absence of alternative ways. Um, This conversation seems important for that reason alone, but I wondered while um, writing the questions, I would like to ask you how far back or how deep in need we go um, to grasp the entire spectrum of the relationship that's as old as the history of humanity itself. Um, And so I thought that perhaps an adequate place to start would be with um, where we are today and an explanation of what you mean when you make the argument that we are living in omnis at all times. Um, What is an omnicide and why is it so relevant today? Yeah, just to, to clarify, uh, this concept of omnicide is not my own, importantly. I picked it up from, from Daniel Sedermeyer, um, who wrote about it in an opinion piece uh, after the Australian bushfires um, four years ago, I think. Um, so I picked up the concept from her, and uh, in my reading of her, her text, she uh, uses this, this concept because the previous concepts that we have for uh, you know, um, talking about what, is, what we are doing to the world uh, in terms of genocide, uh, ecocide and so on and so forth, large-scale killing of others, um, these concepts are not enough anymore because what we are doing now is something much more immense, more acute and, and more sort of um, disastrous consequences for everybody. So, um, Sillermeyer suggests that maybe the, the, the omnicide concept, the killing of everything, is more appropriate. Um, and I found that quite um, eye-opening in a way, and wanted to you know, use that in my own piece, my own article. Um, and I also would like to include, I mean, there's the concept that is possibly less well-known, uh, suicide killing of animals um, that I see as a sort of, you know, it also has it, its place in this omnicide umbrella concept. So um, that is the background. Hmm. It is um, a quite powerful notion. The death of, the, of life itself, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The death of life, the killing of life, I would say. Hmm. Uh, it it's us humans who are doing the killing, basically, at some basic level here. So, mm-hmm. And I think that is also what the, what the term um, omnicide helps us see and helps us realize. Mm-hmm. Um, the discourse surrounding human-animal or, or, or human and animal-other 
um, relationship frequently revolves around resources. Um, this involves viewing animals either as the resources we supposedly need or the occupants of the resources we desire, like land or water or anything else. Um, so there's the question of human expansionism versus, versus what exactly? What's on the other side of this spectrum? Can we achieve some form of natural equilibrium within the confines of the current economic model? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, materialist views on animals are rather predominant in our Western society, I would say. Um, it's, it's not entirely because of capitalism, because uh, also the sociologist David Nybert has reminded us that um, materialist views on animals started long before capitalism, long before we had capitalism, but capitalism made uh, this you know, the materialist exploitation of animals in Marxist terms more acute and more, more sort of, the, the scope expanded uh, quite extensively. So, um, but it, it is a very predominant view on animals in Western society. Um, and what I would like to propose is that the related concept of extractivism might also give some perspective on this. So. Uh, an idea here is that human expansionism and the extractivism of, of natural resources, uh, the appropriation of natural resources from the earth for, for human production purposes, uh, might be entangled with each other and feed into each other. Um, so then, I mean, is, is, is there a possibility to change this and, and see some kind of natural equilibrium, as you put it, uh, in our current economic system? I personally find it quite hard to see how we can do this. Uh, because if you look at how capitalism works, I'm not an economist, but uh, at the basic level, capitalism does not only seek to generate uh, profit and growth, but actually seeks to accumulate profit. So it means that capitalism itself doesn't care about ethics, it doesn't care about sustainability, unless it can gain some profit out from, from those issues, you know, so, or profit from them. So I think this, this powerfully speaks against, you know, um, that we could sort of fundamentally change our relationships to other species um, and the Earth uh, within the remnants of capitalism. Um, on the other hand, also important to, to mention, I think, is that we, as individuals and as a collective, I think we, we really must refuse and resist locking our own minds um, into this capitalist, accumulist, and accelerationist logic. Uh, we must try to think outside of this capitalist box somehow. And I believe there are several thinkers we can turn to for, for guidance in this process. Um, personally, I'm very inspired by Patricia McCormack's notion of grace which she took from uh, Michel Ansar, the famous French philosopher, uh, meaning basically that we, uh, as a species, as human individuals as well, have to step aside, or even step back, and take a step back to allow other species, other beings, to flourish on their own terms, which is rather the opposite of what we are doing today, right? Um, with this materialist, expansionist, extractivist logic we are practicing. Um, so that is one thing. I also think that we have to uh, engage with the support of the, the work of, of advocacy movements. Um, we have examples such as Nature Needs Half, um, advocating for setting aside 50% of, of the planet for nature to, to flourish. And also the rewilding movement, seeking to introduce um, you know, species almost becoming extinct into uh, you know, uh, protected areas. Uh, and also, of course, animal advocacy organizations worldwide. So I think we, we do have guidance uh, and allies and that we can turn to, uh, to, to to work with solutions and find solutions, or paths forward at least. Mm. So much of this conversa conversation um, centers around how we feel about the place where we're at right now, right? And what will our, the next steps be? Um, 
what patterns do you observe in our interaction with animals, considering all species and not just our cherished pets? Have there been any notable occurrences in the recent years that indicate some sort of shift in this dynamic? This is an enormous issue. Um, it's, I don't know where to start, but um, just a few thoughts that might sort of hint at some tendencies. Um, in my experience, at least, um, at the global scale, um, I, it's a very hard to be an optimist in this, in this respect. Um, globally, I think the, the perspective for both wild and domesticated animals uh, seem rather grim, sadly. I mean, we what we have is basically um, a mass extinction of animals that we are fueling. Um, we we tend to push uh, a lot of wild animal individuals and species to the brink of extinction um, with with a sort of massive biodiversity loss as a result. And and this ma mass extinction of wild animals it takes place alongside. Uh, another trend, which is the mass production of, of our so-called food animals uh, for our, our food systems. So. so this parallel mass extinction, mass production of animals, even if it's this different species we talk about, it is, I see it as, it's, it's a huge paradox that we live with in, in contemporary uh, late capitalist society. Um, so, but, but there also, there's also a certain logic to this paradox, uh, and that is the, the uh, production, the mass production of, of livestock, of food animals, as we call them. Um, it also relies on this mass extinction of wild animal species, because we need this, the, the, the habitats, the, the space, the, the, the rainforest, what have you, in order to, to, to clear lands where we can sort of build up our production systems. Um, so, so the, there is an entanglement here as well, uh, with very problematic sort of results. And one result you can see, I know how to refer to this kind of influential, I think, article um, that came some years ago, um, published in, in the Proceedings for the Natural Academy of Sciences. Um, that study um, calculated that humans and their production, so the production animals together far, by far outweigh uh, the wild mammals on Earth now. So uh, counting in terms of biomass, this is a sort of abstract calculation uh, way of doing it, but it, it's one way. Um, I think the ratio is approximately 96% versus 4%. So this means that just a very, very small number in terms of biomass are wild mammals now on Earth which is a very scary and very troubling sort of realization, I think. So, I mean, in, in effect, humans and livestock is taking over, dominating the, the Earth's surface. Um, so here we see, I think, what we talked about previously, that human expansionism, as you mentioned, and extractivism of natural resources, it has, it, it is very, very sort of disastrous and toxic combination for, for animals. Um, not least wild animals. Um, so, so that is one trend that is quite depressing, I think. And we can also s talk about not only the scale, but also the forms of exploitation and commodification of animals that are proliferating as well, sadly. Um, we have, for instance, where we previously had you know, purpose-bred animals for research purposes, where we had um, lab animals basically modeling human diseases uh, for our purposes. Uh, that is not enough anymore. We have now genetically manipulated a lot of animals for literally being um, organ donors for humans, um, like spare part humans, but in animal form. And of course, donors here is a euphemism. They don't consent to this sort of treatment, and we know it. Uh, but that is going on. Um, we have reproduction technologies, if you look at the biotech uh, industry that is proliferating also for, for animal breeding and production. Um, a lot of animal exploitation also problematically goes under the name of sustainability nowadays, which is interesting. So we have, for instance, um, a Swedish startup company uh, called Volta Green Tech, I, I um, assume. Um, and their business idea is to produce a specific, to develop a specific kind of of livestock feed. So if you feed this 
this, these two cows, they will produce less um, you know, greenhouse gases in their bodies. So this means that um, under the name of sustainability, we can keep on our meat, meat consumption habits um, as business as usual um, without having a bad conscience. So this is uh, very interesting and very problematic. Um, another trend, of course, uh, marine animals, largely unprotected, um, is also you know, exploited on a large scale. Fish species disappear. Uh, we have an increasing form of aquaculture. Um, critical animal studies scholar Dinesh National Well has talked about aquaculture as factory farms for fishes, like huge marine farms where fish are kept in crowded conditions with all the welfare problems that we see uh, usually in, in you know, production animals on land. We even have octopus farms emerging in different places uh, to produce meat for us and so on and so forth. So um, this is also part of what we can call the animal industrial complex, uh, expanding. Um, and you mentioned pets. Uh, I think we have to realize also that pets are part of, of even if they're also beloved household members and companions for us, and they can be wonderful relationships between humans and, and their companion animals. Um, I have an adopted dog myself, who I live with, so I know that. Uh, but pets are also part of the yeah, animal industry complex. We have the pet food industry, which is enormous. Um, we have selective breeding techniques that we apply to our animals, uh, our pets. Uh, in Sweden, at least, I know veterinary clinics, uh, our pet clinics, they are increasingly taken over by venture capitalists, just like the welfare sector in, in Sweden, uh, and so on and so forth. So, but talking about pets, I also think that uh, this perhaps increased popularity of living with, with pet animals in new places, such as in Asian countries, um, also has some perhaps positive implications. I know South Korea, Korea recently voted for a ban on dog meat, uh, the production, the breeding of, of dogs for dog meat uh, for human consumption purposes. So there are some positive issues as well. But the scale of the problem nonetheless is overwhelming and we can't really afford to be overwhelmed since we are the culprits of most of these problems. And the, the longer I think about this, the more what comes to mind is how did we get here as humans? What's the psychology of the crowd here? Um, in your recent paper, Education, Anthropocentrism and Interspecies Sustainability, Confronting Institutionalized, Institutional Anxieties in Omnistore Times, you discuss interviews conducted as part of your research. One involved an animal caretaker program where animals were used as study objects and um, the issue raised there was that the recruitment of an idealistic student raised concerns about disrupting the program's atmosphere. You also write about a student wearing a, a t-shirt promoting vegetarianism, causing anxiety within the school. You also mentioned a proposal to implement vegetarianism in the Gothenburg University canteen and how it was rejected. Despite these examples of opposition or disruption, being relatively mild and moderate, they were met with considerable reluctance. Why do you think it is so challenging for us to engage in conversations about dietary changes, something that we have an agency to change? What contributes to the passionate rejection of such, like, I mentioned before, rather mild and non-revolutionary dietary alternatives that could benefit our environments, animals, um, and, and all living beings really so much, us included, because our current diet is not very healthy. Um, I suppose I'm asking here, what's your take on the behavioral psychology involved here? Right. Um, I think this is a topic that uh, engages some food sociologists. Mm -hmm. uh, it is an enormous question, a very interesting one. Just to, to start, to be fair, I, our department, uh, IDPP, now has a vegetarian policy, as far as I know. I'm not sure to what extent it is actually followed up, but at least there is positive development, as, uh, if you ask me. Uh, so I just wanted to note that. Uh, but I think food is a very complex issue. 
Um, there are so many factors that come into play when we decide what to eat. Um, there are emotional factors, social factors. Um, we have gender norms around food and meat consumption, at least. Uh, we have childhood nostalgia. I was raised in this way and I will continue because it, it feels so good. Um, we also have, I think, at some, you know, some level we have, which might be a very, very human thing, but some reluctance to admit that we have been doing wrong previously. Um, I'm just waking up one day and maybe looking back on your life and realizing that, well, what I have been doing, the, what I, my eating habits for the last 30, 40, 50 years or something have been deeply problematic. Um, that is hard for many. Uh, and I know because I've, I've been in that situation myself. Um, so I think not everybody will, will come to that point, and quite understandably, um, if you think about how much you, you invest in your own food habits and eating habits. And you, the thoughts around yourself, your, your self-image around these issues. Um, so it is complex, um, but I also speculate for myself sometimes that not being a psychologist, but uh, maybe at some deep level, uh, veganism might be viewed also as a th implicitly viewed as a threat to human exceptionalism. Now, Donna Haraway's term that uh, denoting that humans are separate from, and not only separate from, but also over and above all other species on Earth, right? So uh, there's this, an exceptional special place for, for humans in the world, which we now know is, is very problematic. Uh, and also as a threat to, to human privileges that come along with human exceptionalism. So veganism might be implicitly viewed as a threat to all this. And so it might be hard for people to, to, to change their eating habits because of this. And also if you think about not only the individual level, but actually the, 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 all the structures and, and conventions in society that work together to, to sort of uphold meat production and consumption as, as systemic as the norm. We have, we have human identity politics, for instance, we talked about the gender norms around meat, for instance, and other foods. Uh, we have the idea of veganism as a kind of lifestyle project that might or may, may not have anything to do with animal ethics and sustainability. Um, and it also may play into the tension between uh, urbanity and rurality in different ways. And this conflict, uh, we have socialization processes um, basically starting when you are a very young child and uh, which purpose is to, is to sort of con make you conform to, to the norms that we have agreed on in society. Uh, often quite unreflected norms such as what to eat and what not to eat. Um, we also have the structures and strat strategies around the animal industrial complex that is, that is heavily investing economically in you know, upholding meat consumption and production in society or not, so both individual and structural level. And of course the education system is also deep, deeply implicated in, in this as well. And in my, my latest book, uh, Schizoanalysis and Animal Science Education, I, I try to show how this happens. Um, so there is a complex, really a very complex structure in society that upholds a lot of forces that, that uphold this, these habits. Um, so that would be my take on the, the behavioral sciences <laughs> around mm. meat consumption and animal foods, animal-based mm. foods. Um, in your paper, you also delve into the concept of institutionalized anxiety. I think something that you slightly touched upon just now, and the hesitancy to embrace incremental ch uh, changes. Um, drawing on Andrew Kolb's Deleuzian analysis of education as an apparatus of change, encompassing techniques associated with state power, you note, education holds itself back from igniting revolutionary instincts because it works in the area of chaos prevention and normalization of the present. Now, I must admit this is perhaps, this sentence perhaps among my favorites. Um, however, for those who view chaos prevention as essential for societal order and see revolutionary instincts as a destabilizing threat. How would you 
as an educator and a researcher, argue for the necessity of plur plurality in a democratic society? Why is it crucial for pedagogy to adopt a critical stance? I think the first thing to be said here is um, something that has turned up quite recently, I think, as an urgent issue, and that is um, the real threat we are facing in, in society today, in my view, is the anti-democratic forces gaining ground, gaining momentum all around us. Uh, we have it in Europe, for instance, as well. So, um, democracy and academic freedom, we must realize that is a precondition for, for us having this conversation at all. Um, so, in many places or countries, this, this would not be possible. You, know, I mean, you and I would not be able to have this, this talk. Uh, it would be banned. Uh, before it even began. So, so the, the freedom to, to discuss openly um, is threatened or stifled. It's under threat. And I think this is very important to recognize. We, we must fight to, to, to keep this freedom and, and our right to, to, to debate. Um, so, well, connecting this to, to the pluralism that you speak about, I think. Thinking about this, of course, it's immensely important that we, we, we keep education as a pluralistic space where everything can be critiqued, uh, but also a pluralistic space for, for you know, creating visionary thinking and acting together with others. Uh, so for me, that is pluralism in its true sense. So, uh, and there are also I know, colleagues in education research who are really advocating for kind of education and pluralism, basically meaning, as I understand it, uh, inclusion in some sense, you know, the like Habermasian sort of pluralism. Uh, for me, I think plurality is more about, you know, uh, it's inherent in any pedagogy, because from an ontological perspective, it can't, it can't be otherwise. I mean, we are, uh, from the beginning, we are, I'm talking with Deleuze now also, as you mentioned Deleuze here, um, we are not individual subjects, or we, we, we will become individual subjects, but first after we have been multiple. So we, we are uh, composed beings before we become individuated, so to say. Um, so, so plurality is an ontological you know, condition for me as well, and, and it follows from there that pedagogy must be inherently uh, pluralistic. But then the problem here, I think, is uh, the concept of pluralism is, is frequently used also in a kind of anthropocentric manner. And uh, Helen Koplina, who is working in education for sustainable development, uh, she has uh, coined this very eye opening term of one species only pluralism that she has observed in, in other education research, partly that I mentioned also, meaning basically that, that pluralism here is, is purely anthropocentric. Uh, it is inclusive of, of humans only, but not other species. So it doesn't relate to other species. So, um, of course, this is important also for, for us in education to uh, engage in critique, this kind of, of critique, in order to, uh, to identify and challenge these, these problematically anthropocentric biases, you can say, uh, and the power asymmetries that they also indicate in our sustainability and, and democracy debates and discourses. So we, we have some work to do there, I think, hmm. as well. Speaking of power, um, you also explore the fairly conventional power slash resistance nexus, where resistance typically emanates from students in a bottom-up manner, rather than originating from teachers themselves, bottom-down, if we think of this as a vertical hierarchy. Could you elaborate on your experience when attempting to introduce material in collaboration with your colleagues on speciesism and animal exploitation into a course program? What transpired in that context? Yes, um, that was an interesting experience that I learned a lot from. Um, we were some colleagues who, who sought to develop a module on critical animal uh, studies, critical animal pedagogies specifically as part of um, a, a course in Education for Sustainable Development. 
Uh, it was a short module, just two weeks, um, in a program that is basically two years, so it was a minor, minor thing, basically. Uh, but as part of this module, we, we decided to, um, to use uh, a video shot by uh, an animal advocacy organization uh, as a learning resource. And this video depicted uh, from inside a slaughterhouse, basically, with, with some, some graphic images, but, but pretty short. So, um, when our colleagues found out about this, uh, some of them became very upset. Um, we had one colleague who actually also um, you know, investigated this video on the web and found out um, some, some sort of evidence or whatever saying that this is not 100% uh, authentic, this video, it's manipulated in certain ways and so on and so forth. Um, so, this became a very controversial thing, of course, in, in this uh, course development process that we were in. So the arguments came here, the pink, this video, the big, big slaughter video is biased. Um, in critical animal pedagogies is a, it's not education, it's a mission rather. Uh, it's not proper education, and education is to be objective and show uh, you know, perspectives from both sides. So we should include also, you know, some proponents on farm, animal farming or whatever, just to balance this video. So that was the kind of conversations we were having. So it was kind of heated, I would say. Um, and we did not agree. Um, and there was even a suggestion that, uh, I mean, the suggestion was to take out the video from the course. Uh, and also the, the conversation ended in, you know, we should take out the actual module altogether from the course. So there should be a critical animal pedagogy in this program. Um, so I think we ended up in a compromise uh, situation, so we decided to take out the video, the controversial video, but we kept the module with some, just some, some slight adjustment, but still the module was largely, largely as it is. Um, so that is what happened. Uh, we have another video now. Uh, actually, it's not the sort of video, but another one that is also uh, quite powerful, but without all the graphics. Um, and it, it's interesting because uh, when I look back on this and what I learned from it, um, I think I learned some, some, some things about, you know, dealing with conflicts with colleagues, but also um, it's interesting to note that the, the, the sort of concerns were on the teacher's side rather than the student's side. So when we actually run the module and introduce the, the materials and everything and the ideas and the, the readings and all that, um, the students were quite engaged and quite positive, I would say. So we got a lot of positive feedback. And obviously for many, this was sort of the first time they, they were exposed to these kind of issues um, in the education. Um, so it was a very positive experience. I mean, for an educator, it's really fantastic to have a group of engaged, truly engaged students. I mean, this is very good for learning as well, if you get engaged with something. So, we're fantastic sort of discussions on the uh, discussion forum and so on. So, um, I think it ended quite well, actually. Hmm. I am a graduate of that program, and that module was among my favorites. So you agree with uh, what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I agree completely. But why do you think, um, what, is the, what is your perspective on this tendency? Or maybe there isn't one, but um, I'll let you answer that. To label discomfort-inducing content as miseducation. Why do you think there is a prevalent fear of subjecting students to discomfort in educational settings? I think this is a difficult question. I think it's very complex. It uh, has many dimensions to it, and I think maybe we are only beginning to uh, sort of talk about this and, and uh, you know, really try to understand what is going on here. Um, I think that first, I mean, we might have cases where students themselves object to certain kinds of uh, teaching on certain subject matter in education. And I know in, in other, uh, not in Gothenburg as far as I know, uh, 
but in other places in Sweden, other universities in Sweden, there has been such cases where students themselves have objected. And in that, those cases, I think um, it creates a lot of uncertainty among teachers. And it may lead to a lot of different things. I mean, even teachers perhaps having to quit, almost, or at least you know, redo their, their whole sort of curriculum. Um, but I also think that, um, yeah, I mean, one thing that usually you know, comes out from this is to sort of issue trigger warnings. You know, a little warning to students before they engage with the material. Uh, and we actually have that in our module in the curriculum and pedagogy is for, before the video is, is shown. It's saying it's voluntary and you don't have it all to look at this if you don't. <laughs> so this is a bit of a trigger warning there as well. Um, so that is, I think, one thing that, one possible way of handling this uh, to give students the choice themselves whether to, to sort of engage with this or not, which is, of course, reasonable in a way. But also interesting uh, that a warning might be needed for adults. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I mean, that is one aspect of all this sort of issue. But perhaps more, more problematic, I think, is, is the, the strong political movement that we have in some countries regarding the teaching of certain kind of subject matter in education. I'm thinking primarily about the US now. But I think we also have examples in Europe, for instance, um, against teaching, um, uh, you know, uh, queer theory, for instance, or gender issues, and LGBT issues, and um, even teaching evolution can be a problem. We should teach creationism instead, according to, to some. So what we have here is not, I think, about student discomfort, it's rather possible parental discomfort uh, or even conservative politics that we are dealing with. So this is another sort of perspective on, on this topic, this issue that you are mentioning. So it is complex, it has many layers. And I think it's important to discuss it. Mm. Mm. Um, we, we talk about institutions and we talk about what and how we produce and what and how we consume it. Um, and I feel that when we talk about institutions, we should also talk about culture, at least consider it. Um, an idea is rooted in capitalism, which we've mentioned before, such as resource exploitation for economic and technological progress. They're not only familiar to likely all humans on Earth at this point in time, but are often a foundation of new business ventures and enterprises, something that you have also mentioned. Um, in the Swedish context. Um, these economic choices undeniably impact our culture. When we examine ourselves in the mirror of capitalism, what reflection do we see? Who is looking back at us? This is perhaps an idealistic question, but if human exceptionalism lies at the center of the anthropocentric design and, should we say, categorization of life, then theoretically we should know all there is about the human subject. But is that the case? Are we in touch with ourselves? What does our relationship with the animal others convey about our perception of who we are and our place in the world? Right. Um, yes, I think you have a point here. I mean, I think this is exactly the point that post-humanist scholars, the question that they have raised for, and argued for the last decades at least, I mean, we are not the rational, transparent, being subjects that we like to think of ourselves and we are not absolutely known by ourselves or even knowable to ourselves. I mean, this is um, just an, an image that we are sort of um, producing about ourselves as part of perhaps human exceptionalism as well, I think that's how we would put it. Um, so we are not in, in control of ourselves in that sense. And uh, this is a very post-humanist way of looking at it. Um, but I'm also not really sure about, and this is also something I've been starting to think about quite recently, uh, what our relationships to, to, to animals actually, if they teach us something and our place in the world, who we actually are, for instance, or how we should live and so on and so forth. And uh, to me, it is, there is something that is problematic here. Um, I think this notion of, of animals as our 
teachers um, really um, does not work. I mean, this is for me. This is just another role we have assigned to them, another function we are assigning to them without their consent. So why should they want to be our teachers in any way? Um, so, and I also don't think that they seem to convince us very much that our present way of living is actually totally unsustainable. At least we don't seem to, to take the impression that this is the case. So, but still, I mean, there, there are actually some, some scholars in, in animal studies and elsewhere that seem to hold on to be wedded to this idea very much, that we, we have a lot to learn from animals about ourselves. Um, so, so this is interesting, but I, I Rob would like to quote another theorist here, and that is Peter Dickens, who said that, as you put it also, uh, that animals are now mirror images of, of capitalism. Uh, and when he said that, he meant that uh, they, they are not just slaves anymore, not just laborers for us, but they are actually something uh, even more urgent. I mean, it's more severe now, uh, the way we use them and exploit them. Uh, they, they are, we have actually made them become mirror images of capitalism itself. Uh, but I'm thinking, surely this applies also to humans. I'm thinking, when we look at ourselves in the capitalist mirror, as you see, um, even if compared to animals here, it might be in a different manner with different implications. Um, I'm thinking about the, the, the way we sort of labor under the gig economy, for instance, many young people do that. And uh, not to speak about you know um, people in in developing countries, so-called developing countries, and so on. So there are lots of, of aspects here um, that we need to go into. Uh, but I, I agree totally with you. It's definitely our I mean, society and culture and together very much, and we have to consider both sides in order to understand what we are doing and what that means. Mm. And there's also a risk of, like you have just said, um, doing the polar opposite, sort of embracing the all or nothing approach. And yeah, like you said, uh, treating animals as our teachers rather than um, perhaps focusing on how we can regain our agency as animals also, because we seem to forget very often that we're also animals and help animals regain that agency and sort of remove them from this, this very tight relationship with, in which we are with them. You also uh, write about the nonconformity and its inherent risk of losing credibility with stakeholders concerning institutional uh, anxiety. Who exactly are those stakeholders? This may seem like I'm jumping far into the abyss, but are we maybe at the point where we should acknowledge that much of modern education is organized to guard certain interests and secure certain political perspectives? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think that is, uh, has been the case for a long time. Uh, when we talk about stakeholders to education, I think there are many um, you know, politicians and policymakers. Uh, different authorities in societies, obviously parents and children are important stakeholders to education. As you said, the private sector, um, the local community, at least, where education is taking place. The media is a stakeholder as well, I would say, and I have been arguing that also animals should be seen as stakeholders to education because they are affected, so deeply affected by what we do in education. Um, so. There's a range of stakeholders, and this also, of course, makes education deeply political, also in a, in a very broad sense, because uh, education forms subjects and affects lives, uh, both human and non-human lives. So uh, education is definitely a, a political enterprise, a political process. And you, you sort of you mentioned that. Um, some stakeholders' interests in influencing education in different ways. Um, and I think it's important to, uh, to see, I mean, this is also from a critical theorist perspective on education, that historically education has always been like a battlefield for, for different interests, for forces, political and other forces in society, to, to, to struggle, when they struggle to exert an influence over education. 
because there's this assumption that if you exert an influence over education, uh, you will all also exert influence over the future, right? So we educate uh, the next generation, basically, to, to take over society. So of course, it's a sort of a very heated debate, a very you know hot place to to um, exert influence over, and lots of interests are at play here. Um, and I think, why is this important to us, to acknowledge? I think it helps us realize education is not only a common good, which is, it should also be that, of course, but it also actually uh, reproduces, actively reproduces injustices of all sorts, domination patterns, unsustainable and unethical practices. Um, so this is sort of traditional critical education theory view on society. I think they, they do have a point. It's, it's important to, to realize that and to discuss that. Um, and what should be our focal points in envisioning a sustainable future? I mean, sustainable. More sustainable than, than what it is uh, today. Um, which values should education strive to advocate and are there any that it should potentially discard? How do we come about redesigning what now seems like an unwelcoming system of less exploitative way of living? Let's try to end here with a positive note. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, I think... I'm a little bit reluctant to to identify like a so a set of predefined values for education, um, partly because education is a very unpredictable thing. You know, there is no as as far as I'm concerned, there is no automatic uh, you know given connection between teaching and learning. So the values that we teach, uh, we can never be sure that they're actually taken up by students, at least not in the way that we intended. <laughs> and not, also not in the long run, of course, what will happen with that teaching of ours. I mean, what will students make of it in the long run? We have no idea, really, uh, most of the time. So, so there is no sort of automatic connection here that is straightforward and simple between what we teach and what we learn. And this, of course, makes that the values we try to sort of you know, communicate uh, quite impossible in a way. Uh, but another issue here that I think is a problem is that uh, education will change along with society. Society and societal changes, even if it, it, it lags behind sometimes, as you know. But any values that we, we try to, to discuss here might just seem obsolete in the long term, so they are not valid anymore. Um, and I think it also seems to lie in the way, you know, the, the, the nature of how education actually works, that uh, we, we educate for a society that we may actually be on our way of leaving behind already. So this lagging behind is sort of, you know, I think it is haunting education in, in different ways. And we have to sort of deal with it in whatever way we can. But it's very hard, I think, for education to keep up with societal change and even even more difficult to actually take a lead in changing society. And it, of course, also involves all kinds of power issues, as we can see that are at stake here. Um, but now, this said, I think it does seem important for education to promote some things. And uh, I would say critical abilities, you know, the ability to critically scrutinize, critically analyze um, anything, basically, is extremely important. Um, so that is one thing. Another thing is the ability or abilities to talk about pluralism, to, to care deeply for others, uh, both humans and non-humans. Um, and the third thing I would say is, is the abilities to, to work together with others for the world to become a better place for everyone. And I mean this in a, almost in a Spinoza way to, to sustain the flourishing of life. So I think this is also an, an obligation on education. And you mentioned if there's anything we should discard, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, um, I would hope we can finally discard some obsolete ideas about human supremacy um, that I think are not valid anymore uh, in, you know, in light of what 
where we see the road is going. Um, and also, perhaps the sometimes implicit or even unconscious assumption that the teachers are some kind of authority figures uh, that take the right upon themselves to actually make assumptions about uh, the world in different ways, but also assumptions about our students um, and what is best for our students. I mean, in some ways, we do have to make those assumptions because it's part of our work, but part of our profession. But I think the best way to to engage in, for education, to engage in shaping the future, is to support the students, uh, to sort of realize your own ambitions and to, to nurture your own capacities to, to develop and, and to drive change. I think this is probably the best investment we can do in education and society. So, so those are the things I would like to uh, leave this conversation with. Hmm. That is also my hope that we will be able to embrace, um, maybe not embrace, but find value in building resistance to potential instability and accept that education to a certain extent is always a venture into the unknown. And the anxiety connected with the unknown and the, and the future, which we cannot predict and control, is natural to humans and has been always. It's a part of who we are as animals, right? Thank you, Helena. I have enjoyed immensely talking to you and I hope our listeners will arrive at the end of this conversation with a similar satisfaction and optimism because a lot isn't working the way it should be, but at least we're talking about it. Um, to all of you on the other side, I invite you to read some of Helena Pedersen's work and continue rebuilding your relationship with animal others because you can start today.